Great. Well, thanks to Allison and the Foresight team and IndieBio for sponsoring this event. It's really exciting to be here. And um, so those are great presentations from uh, Adam and Ben. And in order to get to the, the need for systems level engineering, I would posit that we need to have our underlying fabrication capabilities be reliable enough that we can actually integrate these number of components in a, um, in a robust way. And I'm really excited to share with you some recent work that we've done that we think goes towards this, addresses a vexing challenge for DNA nanotechnology for the last 16 years, which is can we self-assemble distinct DNA origami into much larger structures with the same reliability that we can assemble staple strands into a DNA origami? And this is something that's been bugging me and I think a lot of other people in the field for a long time. And we have now a really elegant solution led by work from Chris Wintersinger and also Dio Minev, who's a B-Staff scientist, but also a Foresight Fellow, and Anastasia Ershova, who's a graduate student in the lab and who's also incredibly talented. So first, just to bring us all to the same page, many of you guys are familiar with this animation, Oldie But Goodie from Sean Douglas, uh, showing Paul Rudiman's DNA origami. You have a long single strand of DNA. We know what that sequence is. And then we chemically synthesize hundreds of oligonucleotide staple strands that are 20 to 60 bases long, pinch it together into a parallel rib double helices into any de desired shape. And what's been the most amazing thing about this method to me is that you have this huge excess of the staple strands and you ex get exactly the number of DNA origami out as you add copies of the scaffold. And because, I think because you're operating this rich bath of excess staple strands, that's part of what makes this process so robust. And just to give you um, as an example of some applications for an individual DNA origami, I think that'll be useful for thinking about what could be useful if we have a thousand DNA origami structure. So this is the application in our group led by Cl uh, Dr. Claire Yang Zheng. And our goal has been to design DNA origami based cancer vaccines that can um, basically reverse a type of immune dysregulation known as TH2 polarization that neutralizes the benefits of immune checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapies. And what we found is that if we present on DNA origami pegboards these CPG oligonucleotide danger signals with precise nano nanoscale spacing to dendritic cells, we're actually able to get switching back of the immune system to a so-called TH1 polarization that then is good for CD8-mediated uh, T cell killing of tumor cells. So just very briefly, um, we have this uh, DNA origami. Each one of these cylinders is a double helix. It's about 20, 25 nanometers per side. These green things here represent CPG oligonucleotides, these uh, danger signals with controlled spacings. On the other side, we have uh, tumor antigens. And so here, this is just looking at the top view, and the green represents where we're placing these CPG oligonucleotides, 18 of them. We can control the spacing very precisely because it's DNA origami. And what we found is that specifically a 3.5 nanometer uniform spacing really does a much better job of this um, as a cancer vaccine than the other spacings. So just uh, very briefly, one experiment that we do is with a mouse model, we inject at one location with a half a million of this model melanoma tumor cells um, at this location here. And then three, seven, and 14 days later, we're injecting at a remote site the DNA origami vaccine. And we're trying to build up an immune response so that those T cells will get instructed, traffic to the side of the tumor, and kill it off before the mouse itself dies. And what we found, here's a survival curve of the mice. So survival on the y-axis, then time on the x-axis. And the bottom line here is that when we have that three and a half nanometer spacing, we get a much, much longer uh, longevity for these mice. So we're, we're excited about this as an application for that very precise nanoscale control that DNA origami provides. And as many of you know, DNA origami are not necessarily just passive structures. They can also incorporate all kinds of active materials, undergo conformational changes. So this is a work that we published a couple years ago. What we did is we integrated um, circular double-stranded DNA templates that are catenated so they can freely rotate close by to T7 RNA polymerases that can then undergo rolling circle transcription of RNA that extrudes out of this so-called nanofactory and then also can be uh, processed by these Cas6 e endonucleases. So you can really get rich functionality even with a handful of DNA origamis. So that leads to the, the main topic of this presentation, which is, well, what about if we could reliably stitch together orders of magnitudes more of these DNA origami into, into large structures? Then, well, first of all, how would we do that and secondly, what kind of applications might be possible? And um, so one area that, of applications that might be possible is if we look again at this notion of presenting ligands to cells. So here shown on the left is 
a uh, little T cell uh, in yellow and then a dendritic cell uh, false colored in cyan. And the interface between these cells, so basically the dendritic cell is instructing that T cell, uh, let's say, to kill off a tumor cell. And the important thing here is that that interface that the cells are communicating can span multiple micrometers in dimension and can have very specific spatial organization of ligands, so MHC peptide on one hand and T cell receptors on the other hand. And depending on whether or not it's in a, let's say, unipolar arrangement versus a multipolar arrangement, can spell the difference between an inhibitory signal or an activating signal. So this could be incredibly important in order to maximize our abilities to instruct T cells to do things like kill uh, tumors. And then over on the, on the right is a T cell that's uh, attacking a tumor cell. And so again, the point is that the interface between these cells can be very, very large. And if we could mimic those interfaces in that spatial organization, we think that could be incredibly powerful for medicine. So that's just one example of how this might be useful. And um, there's been some nice work towards this end of, of stitching together DNA origami. So this is work from uh, Greg and Lulu Chen from a few years ago. And what they did was they took a fractal approach of linking together 64 distinct DNA origami. And what they did was they had careful design of the interfaces and stoichiometries and the uh, temperature ramps. And firstly, linked together uh, four into these two by two arrays. In the second step, they mixed these together to make these uh, four by four arrays. And then mixed four of these together to make these eight by eight arrays. And what we can see from their reported results is that when they're making four DNA origami or 16 DNA origami structures, the yield was pretty good. But then as soon as they jumped up to 64 DNA origamis, then the yield started to really precipitously drop. And this gives you a flavor for how difficult, I mean, it's easy to just say, why don't we just stitch DNA origami together? But it's really hard. And so the upshot is that if you're trying to stitch together something like a dozen DNA origami, then there are some really nice methods available. But as soon as you're trying to make something that's hundreds or thousands of DNA origamis big, then we don't really have a solution. Um, until now, we, we think we have a solution now. And our solution is something that we call crisscross polymerization. And here our building blocks are individual DNA origami that are about half micron long, and they're decorated with these little glues, specific glues that are spaced every 14 nanometers. So it's like you have a 30 tumor polymer where each of the glues is spaced by 14 nanometers. And we can put any sequence here we want, but we found that what works well is these seven nucleotide sequences. Um, Chris decided on a library of 32 sequences as our complements at each of those 32 positions. So that's the, the palette of colors that we can choose from, and that works pretty well. We, we have to force these objects by sequence design to only interact at a single position at a roughly 90 degree angle. And that's really important because we, we want to, this to rely on weak bonds and to, for things to only happen when you get cooperative assembly with a, a large number of binding partners. So here's an example of the first structure that we tried to build that also has 64 DNA origamis. Hiding behind in red there is a seed, actually, that's controlling the assembly. So we have thermodynamically favored assembly of these uh, 32 vertical slats and 32 horizontal slats that's kinetically blocked except uh, when in the presence of this seed, and then you get one-to-one -one assembly. And we operate this, let's say, at a temperature where you need 16 bonds for a stable assembly. And under these conditions, it's basically kinetically impossible to ever get to the transition state for assembly, the critical nucleus, where you have 16 horizontal, 16 vertical uh, slats that are each making 16 bonds to each other. Because if you start from individual slats, then what, what happens is every time you have those come together, you're always making far fewer than 16 bonds, which means it's, you're just going uphill energetically. And this is to the point where you, if you did the calculation, you filled the oceans with these things, and you waited the age of the universe, then in theory, nothing should happen, even though it's thermodynamically favored. And then once you form the critical nucleus, then it can go on to form the final structure. Um, but we bypass that by providing a seed that uses very strong binding interactions to non-cooperatively capture the first 16 slats, and then we bypass that energy barrier. So we have, the, the bottom line is we have controlled assembly of these structures by an instructor, that seed, but the seed is now a very small fraction of the size of the overall object. Whereas with DNA origami, it requires a scaffold that's half the mass of the final object. So here's a, a transmission electron micrograph of the object. Um, in, in the background, we also have some um, individual DNA origami that you can kind of vaguely see here as a, as a size comparison. These are individual uh, structures. They're half micron by half micron in size. The incorporation efficiency of individual DNA origami into each of these lattices is up to something like 98%. So it's not 100% because individual DNA origami have defects. And eventually those defects add up to missing slats. 
But we would argue this is incredibly good on the order of the efficiency of incorporation of staple strands into a DNA origami. So we're really, really happy um, to get this kind of result as a starting point. And maybe we can do better. This is a zoom out. You can see a six micron scale bar. And you'd be hard pressed to find any of these objects that look like they're incomplete. So the first approximation, uh, this, again, this is going to the same kind of efficiency that we see with DNA origami itself. Then we were emboldened to try to make bigger structures. So this is where we were about, about a year ago. A uh, structure with almost 200 unique slats over the magical one gigadalton size limit. So nobody had built anything of this size before from unique components. And the overall lateral dimensions getting close to one micrometer. And then um, it was well past Valentine's Day, but Chris and colleagues decided to uh, start the assembly down here on the bottom with a bidirectional growth front that eventually the two arms would meet at the top. This has almost 600 slats. Um, here's an object that's from almost 1,000 slats. The growth starts from the upper right-hand temple of the structure, and you have this, again, bidirectional growth front. Now, with uh, the overall dimensions are about two microns, so this is absolutely massive by molecular standards. And now, once you start to try to have a, a design a systems-level process with 1,000 sequential steps, now you start to really see very small, um, very small errors start to add up after 1,000 steps. And what we found, here's a, a zoom out, um, is that we get an overall yield of something like 20 to 25% of those seeds will go all the way to the end. Um, we'd like higher yield, but we were just absolutely, I just have to tell you, we're absolutely pleased to get this kind of yield from a step that's 1,000 uh, units long. Just imagine, how, how many times have you seen a DNA oligonucleotide that's directly synthesized that's 1,000 bases long? I don't think it's ever been reported. Nobody tries to make something bigger than 300 just because, um, because the yields aren't, aren't high enough. And again, the reason, we think the reason why they terminate is because it's that accumulation of errors in the individual DNA origami. Eventually, stochastically, you're going to hit some breaking points. And, and we think we can do better, but this is really great for a first try, we think. Um, so this is the biggest structure that we built. It's over 1,000 slats. Again, each edge is about two microns. Because it's made from over 1,000 completely different DNA origami, and for each DNA origami, you have absolute control over the addressability of each of those spots, that means we have complete addressability in X, Y, Z for where we place guests on this object, just like with the DNA origami, but a thousand times, with a thousand times as many volume elements. So here's an animation from Diomina illustrating the process, that we have this thermodynamically favored process, but it will only start when we give it this red seed, the size of one DNA origami, that uses strong binding interactions non-cooperatively that capture the first 16 DNA origami slats, and then we have a bidirectional growth front, one going from the left and to the right. And we program it to add 16 slats at a time. So if we just focus on the right, so you get 16 slats added going down to the right, down to the left, down to the right, down to the left, and so on and so forth. And we can program this to raster around. Until we get the final structure. And then what we're doing is that um, we're deck we're decorating each position here with or without a single-stranded DNA handle that's maybe 20 bases long, but you can't see it. There's not enough contrast under TEM, so to get contrast, we hybridized a 10 nanometer DNA nanocube with a complementary strand that will hybridize only on those pixel positions where we programmed one of those handles to be. And then we get good contrast in the TEM. And so you can see the correspondence here between our design and the structure. It's um, yeah, we were so pleased to see how well this works. And to be honest, you, you never know how well something like this is going to work and to, until you actually try. And then you need really talented people to <laughs> figure out all the tricks to get it to work as well as it does. So how big is this? Well, an individual E. coli is half micron by one micron in dimensions. So you could imagine packing eight E. coli, like Vienna sausages, onto one of these objects. So we really think we're, we're literally approaching the kind of complexity we need to build things the size um, and sophistication of cells, although right now it's just static components. So these are just a few different other patterns that we created. <laughs> it's Harvard insignia. OK, so um, yeah, so to be honest, one never is quite sure why something works as well as it does. But we'd like to hypothesize that two elements that are, we think are key contributors. And so one is this ultra cooperative requirement for lots of things to come together and to make interactions that are non-nearest neighbor allows us to create this absolute seed dependence of nucleation that's very robust. And that means we can drive the system with very large concentrations of those excess building blocks and get robust growth. And that helps to get um, yeah, this robust, rapid, air-free 
driven growth. It turns out the second order rate constant of these things coming together is 10 to the sixth per molar per second, which is normally what you think about of individual DNA strands coming together. But this is massive DNA origami with those kind of kinetics, and, and it's really, um, we think it's really powerful. So to conclude, uh, what we've been able to develop, it might look like an advance in DNA nanotechnology to make these big structures, but what I posit is ev the even bigger um, gain we think from our work is that we've come up with a new algorithm for controlling nucleation. And the only requirement for this algorithm is that you have building blocks that are elongated that have regularly spaced specific glues, which implies that we could recompile the same algorithm to generate protein structures that could do the same thing, or inorganic nanorods that if, as long as we can decorate them with these specific glues. Or another thing we were interested in doing is using this for a third level hierarchy. So can we use this to build super slats that are each made from 100 of these DNA origami and then assemble those. So can we make the origami of origami of origamis? And for that reason, I think this, this basically implies that we have headroom to continue, the, continue this exponential trend of increase, reliable increase in number of uh, functional elements. And um, maybe it goes without saying that that's going to really dramatically uh, increase our, our need for systems level thinking and software tools in order to handle this kind of complexity. So I'd like to thank the following sources for, uh, for funding and look forward to the rest of the workshop. Thank you, wonderful. We now have a mic that doesn't strangle you guys. So I will be doing the Q&A with this. So, so I'm very much an outsider to the molecular machines field, but the first thing I think about with these yield rates and composing them is, is there a notion of error correcting codes in the context of building these things so that you can overcome the product of numbers less than one? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I think there's a, yeah, there's a whole, whole bunch of things that could be all, all along that theme. So, so for example, um, can you make just like with a computer chip, then oftentimes you'll have something of a cores and then you'll just throw away the core that, that has a defect in it. So can you make functional objects that have some kind of parallelism of growth? So it self-assembles into 16 different compartments. Each compartment has a function, but because it's being built in parallel, maybe you can do some kind of quality control to just throw away the ones you don't, you don't want. So that's an example. Um, an area where it's gonna be maybe even more important is can we do this so-called algorithmic assembly where we're reusing a small number of building blocks that get incorporated many times into the object. But uh, so for an example that's often cited is a binary counter. So can we have um, like four n number of components can, can basically count to n, n squared, some, something like that. And in that case, you have a extreme, you have a real need that you don't have errors because um, if you start incorporating errors, then that, that can propagate. Whereas with these, the one, what I showed you is not very algorithmic, it's very dumb, it's just you have one, every component is exactly specified where it's, where it's going to go. But for, I think those algorithmic approaches, which are going to be important for scaling to much larger complexities, then we absolutely need um, error, error correction. And, and there's some precedent, maybe we can talk after, there's precedent in the field for um, error correcting codes that I think are going to be important for, for, uh, for dealing with those errors. I was curious if you can uh, talk about where the field is at uh, for, for actually programming dynamics into the DNA origami. So, so doing that in a predictive capacity such that you can actually make things, you know, not just a structure, but, but something that functions. Yeah, thanks, great question. Uh, yeah, so I would say to, to first approximation, anything that you can do with protein, we can do with the nucleic acid as well in terms of generally programming dynamics. The ligand that's been the easiest to handle is just DNA strands. So there's this operation known as uh, toehold-mediated strand displacement that uh, Andrew Turperfield was one of the first pioneers in this. So you basically have this single-stranded toehold region where you can initiate binding of the displacing strand and then you get branch migration to kick things off. And this is an incredibly robust process. The, um, you, it's basically can be nucleation limited. So if you add one micromolar concentration of these things, you'll, you'll get a rate, uh, rates about one per second of kicking things off. But there's also people have done things with ap uh, aptamers and then you could, uh, these so-called structure-specific aptamers, so they're competing between binding DNA and binding some ligand that's not DNA, a protein, small molecule, something that that aptamer has evolved to bind. And so what happens is it's dynamically doing this, you add the protein, it binds this thing, and then 
and then you can in induce a conformational change. Um, so that's just equilibrium ligand -like binding, but other groups have generated systems that can actually do uh, catalytic multi multiple turnover, such, such as edge turbo field, um, using hybridization-based fuels, but you could easily imagine integrating catalytic components so that you could use um, chemistry, just like enzymes do, in order to drive multiple cycles without having to do any external um, intervention. And then the third area that I think is really powerful and people like is using external fields in order to cycle systems. So you could have, my favorite is thermal cycling, but you could have voltage cycling, you could have uh, electric field cycling, magnetic field cycling, ultrasound cycling, pH change. So all of these external manipulations I, I think are very powerful as well.